Okay, welcome everybody. I've got 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so why don't we get started. For those of you who just joined, welcome to the NASA Earth Data Webinar, Discover NASA's Archive for Space Geodesy Data at the Crustal Dynamics Data Information System. And this is your host, Jennifer Brennan. So while everybody's logging in, we do have two polls at the bottom left and middle of your page that I'd like you to answer, if you could take a second. I noticed that most of you, or many of you, have already done so. Um, I am the NASA Earth Observing System Data and Information System, or EOS DIS, User Support and Communications Lead at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and also your host for these monthly webinars. So I'd like to begin by going over a few housekeeping items related to the webinar. First, due to the large number of participants and also to ensure best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. We do have a uh, really large crowd registered for today's webinar. Uh, however, if you have any issues or questions, you can enter them into the Q&A pod, which is located here in the bottom right-hand corner our right-hand side of your screen, and this works like a chat. So if you have a technical issue or any other question, um, please feel free to enter those throughout. What we will do is we will take all questions by way of the Q&A pod at the end of the webinar, okay? Um, the webinar itself will be recorded. I will post this to our NASA Earth Data Adobe Connect catalog, which I will provide the URL to you at the end. All presentation files will also be available for download at the end of the webinar. The webinar itself is one hour long, and we usually allocate 45 minutes to the presentation and live demonstration portion, and then we'll have an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. So after the speakers have finished their presentations, we will then move to the final set of polling questions. The question and answer period actually follows right after the final set of polling questions. So make sure you stay on the line and or stay in the room to participate. As I mentioned earlier, you do have an opportunity to ask your questions throughout all portions of the webinar with the exception of the live demonstration. And you'll use, again, the Q&A pod in the lower right-hand side of your screen. Due to the large number of participants, questions will not be answered using the raising hand function. I have disabled uh, that function. And again, we will take all questions using the Q&A uh, pod at the end. One final note, depending upon the volume of questions that are received, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes to 3.15 for those of you who wish to stay on the line. Uh, if you have a hard deadline at 3, um, feel free to leave at that time. But if you're still interested in participating and we have a lot of questions, then we'll continue on to 3.15. Let's move next to the agenda. All right, and uh, hopefully you know I've, everybody seems to be hearing me OK for those who are listening to audio by way of the computer. So that's fantastic. Um, and welcome again. Welcome back to my repeat. Uh, participants, so I'm happy to have you. So the first 20 minutes or so today, we will provide you with an introduction to the NASA Crustal Dynamics Data Information System, DAC. We'll cover the basics regarding geodesy and also present some information about the data holdings and the user community. During the next 10 minutes, we will switch speakers and we will also switch over to the live demonstration where you will receive a tour of the CDDIS website as well as a demonstration for the CDDIS Site Log Viewer Tool, which is part of their website. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Carrie Knoll who is the CDDIS Manager at Goddard Space Flight Center. Carrie? Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, it's really great to join you today and provide information about our DAC. Uh, as Jennifer said, I am the manager of the CDDIS, the Crustal Dynamics Data Information System, and have worked on the system since its start in 1982. Uh, I'm a computer scientist here at NASA Goddard and have worked here for a little over 33 years. So today uh, I will start by giving you a brief background on the system, where we came from and how we started. 
Then I would like to give you a tutorial on geodesy, particularly space geodesy, since the topic may be new to many of you. I'll then move to a review of the contents of the archive and our user community. I will then turn the presentation over to Lori, who will show you our new website and one of the applications we have developed for data discovery. Finally, I'll conclude the webinar with a brief overview of some of the future plans we have for the CDDIS. The Crustal Dynamics Data Information System is NASA's active archive of space geodesy data, products, and information about these data and products. Our archive primarily consists of the following types of data and their derived products. GNSS, or Global Navigation Satellite System, SLR and LLR, Satellite and Lunar Laser Ranging, VLBI, Very Long Baseline Interferometry, and DORIS. Doppler, orbitography, and radio positioning integrated by satellite. I will explain each of these techniques in more detail later. The CDDIS has been in operation for over 30 years, since 1982, when it was created to support NASA's very successful Crustal Dynamics project. We are located at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. In October 2007, support for the CDDIS was reorganized at NASA headquarters, and it became the 12th EOS DIS DAC. Prior to that time, we were funded through the Solid Earth Research Program, which supports many of the space geodesy activities and researchers. CDDIS is central to the data management of NASA's Space Geodesy Program, a partnership with JPL to develop and deploy NASA's next generation network of space geodesy stations. Last year, our proposal to the International Council for Science World Data System was accepted, and we joined other EOS, EOS DIS DACs as a regular member of the WDS. Since geodesy, and in particular space geodesy, may be a new topic to many of you, I thought I would spend a few slides giving you some background on the science and the techniques I mentioned earlier. Here you see two versions of the Earth. The image on the left shows a typical view of the Earth from space. But in truth, the Earth is not a perfect sphere. It is bumpy. There are many forces acting on the Earth, tides, gravity, etc., shown in the diagram on the right. The Earth rotates, it wobbles, the plates shift. Geodesy is the study of the shape of the Earth, its geometry and deformation, the gravity field of the Earth and its temporal changes, and the orientation and rotation of the Earth and its variation. Space geodesy is the use of precise measurements between space objects, such as orbiting satellites and distant, distant quasars, to determine positions of points on the Earth, the position of the Earth's pole, the Earth's gravity field and geoid, as well as to enable research in other geodynamic areas. The techniques of space geodesy are GNSS, SLR, VLBI, and DORIS. I will explain each of these techniques in more detail later in this presentation. The systems pictured here are all located at Goddard Space Flight Center. We are one of the few locations in the world that is home to all four techniques. In addition, NASA Goddard is the home of the first successful satellite laser ranging measurement, which occurred 50 years ago in October 1964. As we know, the Earth is constantly changing shape. This movement can have a devastating impact on society and on our economies. Earthquakes, rising sea levels, floods, droughts, storms, tsunamis. Space geodesy monitors the Earth's system. This monitoring helps us understand the environmental processes and their interactions. To be understood in context, when the motion of the Earth's crust is observed, it must be referenced. Space geodesy networks are fundamental to monitor and understanding Earth processes for both ground and space me measurements. Continuous monitoring is absolutely crucial. This monitoring can be accomplished through the use of the space geodesy techniques, which rely upon a global network of stations. These techniques allow scientists to determine the positions 
and velocities of the stations in the global networks very precisely at a sub-centimeter level. Network measurements must also be continuous, robust, reliable, and geographically distributed worldwide. Each technique has unique properties that bring unique strengths to the determination of this reference frame. These properties include radio versus optical measurements, terrestrial versus celestial reference, broadcast up versus broadcast down, range versus range difference measurements, and in geographic coverage. This map shows the current network of space geodesy sites. As you can see, there are many red dots, or GNSS sites. GNSS equipment is much less expensive and easier to install and operate. SLR and VLBI, shown with yellow and blue symbols, are more expensive to construct and operate, so there are fewer locations. DORA sites, shown with orange symbols, are also more geogra geographically distributed. A principal goal of geodesy is to assign coordinates to points as a function of time. The space geodetic systems in these global networks provide measurements that are needed to define and maintain a terrestrial reference frame, or TRF. As I said, the Earth is changing. We must reference the motion of the Earth's crust. A terrestrial reference frame, or TRF, provides a set of coordinates of points located on the Earth's surface that can be used to measure the changing Earth, such as movement due to plate motion. The TRF is an accurate, stable set of station positions and velocities. The TRF provides for remote monitoring of key contributors to global change, such as sea level, sea surface and ice surface topography, crustal deformation, temporal gravity variations, among others. Without a proper understanding of the Earth's shape, enabled by the TRF, our ability to measure sea level rise, for example, would not be possible. It models changes in the Earth's crust, which can be used to compare observations from different epochs. This refer reference frame provides a spatial and temporal link between missions. The four types of network measurements are interconnected by co-location of different observing techniques at a single site like at Goddard Space Flight Center. The figure here shows the determination of the last TRF realization, the International Terrestrial Reference Frame in 2008. Data from 20 years of space geodetic observations were utilized to define the positions and velocities of these sites. Analysts are currently working on contributions to the next version of the ITRF, ITRF 2013. Now I would briefly like to describe each of these space geodesy techniques. Here we show GNSS, or Global Navigation Satellite System. You are all familiar with GNSS. The US GPS, or Global, Global Positioning System, is one example of a GNSS. GLONASS is another GNSS developed by Russia. Galileo has been developed by the European community. Baidu is a Chinese GNSS and there are GNSS under development in Japan and India. GNSS is used for navigation, surveying, atmospheric, and space weather applications. The space segment for GNSS consists of a set of high orbiting satellites, 24 in the case of GPS, that are equipped with precise clocks that transmit orbital information to ground-based receivers. The ground network consists of precise, multi-frequency receivers and antennas. To determine the location of the GNSS antenna, the receiver measures its distance from at least three satellites by precisely calculating the time it takes for a radio signal to travel from each satellite to the receiver. The types of GPS receivers used in space geodesy are very precise, much more so than those in your phone or car. They can determine position to millimeters. The CDDIS archives data from a network of over 500 receivers. There are thousands more in other national and international programs. The dense network is one advantage of the GNSS technique. Receivers and antennas are relatively inexpensive compared to the other techniques. 
In satellite laser ranging, or SLR, the space segment consists of satellites equipped with corner cube reflectors. These reflectors are passive and have the property that when illuminated by a laser beam, the light is reflected back to its source. Reflector-equipped satellites could be those dedicated to geodetic measurements, such as LAGIOS, shown here, or remote sensing satellites like JSON, where SLR is used for precise orbit determination that supports the measurements of the main payload. The ground segment consists of a short pulse laser system. The telescope collects the return signal and the time of flight is measured, which is used to determine the range to the satellite to a precision of a few millimeters. This two-way range measurement from ground to satellite yields distance and satellite orbit. SLR is the most accurate technique currently available to determine the geocentric orbit of an Earth satellite, which can be used for precise calibration of radar altimeters. The current network consists of about 40 global SLR stations tracking over 60 satellites on a regular basis. Some stations are lunar capable, meaning their systems can range to reflectors left on the moon by Apollo and Russian missions. One of these reflector arrays is shown on the bottom right. Very long baseline interferometry is a passive system. VLBI measures the time difference between the arrival of the radio waves from distant quasars to at least two antennas located on the Earth. The geometry of the measurement yields the distance between the two antennas to a few millimeters. The ground segment consists of radio telescopes equipped with wideband receivers. Since the radio sources, the quasars, are at such extreme distances, they appear fixed in space and provide a stable celestial reference frame. This technique can thus track changes in the orientation of the Earth in space. The current VLBI network consists of about 45 radio telescopes. The final space geodetic technique is DORIS, or Doppler Orbitography and Radio Positioning Integrated by Satellite. The DORIS concept was initially developed by several French groups for precise orbit determination. The space segment consists of satellites equipped with a DORIS receiver and uplink hardware, shown in the two images in the lower left, that receive radio frequency transmissions from globally distributed beacons. The Doppler shift on the signals is measured, and the location of the beacon can be determined. One advantage of this technique is that DORS is based on an uplink device. The data receivers are on board the satellite, while the transmitters are on the ground. Therefore, the ground-based infrastructure is minimal, allowing for a more homogeneous geographical distri distribution of DORS sites. The current DORS network consists of 58 beacons observing five satellites. I have described space geodesy and the techniques used. I will now describe the CDDIS archive and how we operate. As I said earlier, the CDDIS began in 1982 supporting NASA's Crustal Dynamics Project, which was an international effort to use space geodesy techniques to monitor plate motion and the rotational dynamics of the Earth with unprecedented accuracy. The CDP paved the way for cooperative investigation using space geodesy, primarily SLR and VLBI. However, the cost of building, operating, and deploying these systems was high, and the global coverage was low. By the late 1980s, government agencies, universities, and other groups began deploying GPS receivers in permanent configuration for scientific study with a goal to achieve millimeter level positioning. However, it was soon realized that no single government agency or group could do the job on a global scale. The solution was the establishment of international cooperative partnerships to facilitate research. The International Association of Geodesy, or the IAG, fostered multi-level international cooperation in networks, in data centers, 
in analysis groups to facilitate this research. They establish services, such as the International GPS Service, or IGS, for this purpose. The IGS has provided precise GNSS observations and products for over 20 years. Today, the International GNSS Service is a voluntary organization of over 200 agencies in over 90 countries. The IGS served as a model for the creation of other services for space geodesy techniques. The International Laser Ranging Service, the International VLBI Service for Geodesy and Astronometry, and the International DORA Service. These services function as cooperating federations dedicated to a particular type of space geodetic data and derived products. They provide these data and products on an operational basis to a broad scientific community. These services are examples of a successful model of community management. They develop standards, are self-regulating, monitor their performance, and define and deliver products using predetermined schedules. The services are successful operation through cooperation of many international organizations who leverage their respective limited resources to all levels of service functionality. These services constitute the primary user community for the CVDIS. Each of the services discussed in the last slide operates with a similar structure for transferring data, products, and information from observing station to the user community. This structure, shown here, is the basis we use at the CDDIS for populating our online archive. The data centers are a focal point for service operations. The CDDIS is the only data center serving all four of what we call the geometric services mentioned earlier. Here you can see that stations send raw or level zero data to an operations center that is responsible for initial QC and format conversion. The resulting level one data are then forwarded to global data centers like the CDDIS where the data are rapidly made available to analysis centers and the user community in general. These analysis centers generate standard level two products that are then pushed back to data centers for availability to the users. This data flow is very simple and thus has made a successful, robust method for providing data for global networks in a timely fashion. Now that I've discussed what space geodesy is and how data and derived products flow to the CDDIS, I would like to review our archive contents. The archive can be divided into three types of content categories, data, products, and the data. Data, what we think of as level one data, are the output from the global networks of stations. The CDDIS deals in point data. There are no imagery data. Files are in compressed ASCII format using a variety of data type or technique specific formats. The data can span time periods of several days, a single day, an hour, or a sub-hour, and are typically delivered within minutes of the end of the observation period. As part of the data ingest procedures, we extract metadata to keep track of the incoming files and their content. These metadata are also used, of course, for EMS and included in ECHO. At this time, our metadata database is primarily accessible internally only. Analysis centers retrieve the files and generate standard level two products for the services, such as precise satellite orbits, station positions and their velocities, Earth orientation parameters, and atmospheric parameters. The CDDIS contains data and derived products from over 1,500 observing sites located at about 1,000 locations around the world, going back in time as far as 1975. The archive is updated with new data files on varying timescales, dependent on the data type, 
from a sub-daily basis to a weekly basis. Stations and operation centers push files to the CDDIS incoming server. Automated routines move the files to the archive within minutes of receipt following execution of procedures for data QC, metadata extraction, and ancillary file update or creation. Analysis centers require continuous access to data for generation of products on predetermined schedules. The average, of the, the average user of the CDDIS accesses the contents of the archive through anonymous FTP or the web by means of automated scripts executed on predefined schedules, typically sub-daily. Analysts can use this method for data transfer because they are familiar with the structure of the online archive and thus know what files are where and what they require, their availability schedule, and where to find them within this online structure. In addition, other data centers supporting the international services retrieve files from the CDDIS archive to equalize data holdings. Here you can see that in 2000, 2013, we typically distributed over 40 million files a month, totaling 5 to 6 terabytes in volume. The majority of our files are relatively small, from kilobytes to a few megabytes in size. The current size of the archive is just over 8 terabytes and consists of over 115 million files. I should add here that the entire archive is online. We have no offline data. In recent months, we have ingested around 5 gigabytes from about 60,000 files each day. We have a rather large distribution rate, as we saw earlier, nearly 250 gigabytes from 2.5 million files each day. As you can see from this pie chart, the majority of the archive is devoted to the support of GNSS data and derived products. This slide illustrates the many worldwide groups that we support on a daily basis. I've now come to the end of the first part of our webinar. I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer to introduce the demo segment. Okay, well thank you, Carrie. We'll now switch to the live demonstration portion of this webinar, and it is my pleasure to introduce our second speaker today, Lori Tayala, who is a user support analyst for the CDDIF as well as their webmaster. Lori? Thanks, Jennifer. I, I'm Lori Tayala, and I've been working with CDDIF since about 2010, although since 1993 I have been involved with the Earth Sciences Division and in various capacities. Today I would like to show you a little tour of our newly designed website. At the top is our, we have our, um, I'm sorry, at the top we have drop down menus that can get you to any place on the page and under about data in your research. The rest of the page is arranged in about three major parts. The first one on the right being a map. This is the map, the same map that Carrie showed earlier. Uh, it, Carrie showed it earlier, showing the locations of the sites around the world. Uh, you can zoom in on this map and pan it around. And there's a legend over to the lower left that shows what type of technique is used at that particular site. And as you can see here on the east coast of South America, we have one that uh, is a GNSS site as well as a VLDI site. We also have regional maps that you can click on if you're interested in a specific re a region. And you can zoom in on all of that. To the left of the map, we have direct access to the data and products. If you select Global Navigation Satellite System, you land on a landing page that describes an overview of the product and data archive. In the left navigation, you'll, no, you'll notice uh, we have data holdings, product holdings, reports, and related links. If you click on a particular type of data, such as high rate data, this takes you to a page that explains what the high rate data is, what format it is in, and also a base URL 
that goes to the FTP site. You would start with this URL to get to the data, and you would append the following directory and file names to the starting directory, as described in the table below. So you would start at GNSS data high rate, and then as you're going through the FTP archive, you would select you know, the first four Ys are the year that you're interested in, and then the next three are the three-digit day of the year, and so on. Going back to the home page, uh, those data are also available for on that particular page. You can also scroll down and look at the SLR data at the same time and move around within the data through these left navigation menus. Going back to the home page, the central third of the page is all about the techniques. This is where you would learn about a little bit more about how the techniques work. And if you look at this drop-down menu here, you have three options to go to the overview. It also lists the service of the International Association of Geodesy that supports that particular data, as Terry had mentioned earlier. If we go to this page, we'll get a little bit more information on, on GNSS and the types there are and how it supports the IGS and a few other pieces of information. You'll also notice on this left nav that you can, from here you can also get to the other techniques using the same method, clicking on the, the arrows. And GNSS also has experiments and projects, working groups, and relay links. So you can get to any of that through that page there. Then back to the home page, the bottom third, we have news and reports and data discovery. This is the part of the website that will change the most often as we post news about things that are happening, you know, meetings and news that's going on within the community. And under reports, we'll have, this is, gives you direct access to the daily and hourly data holdings without reports about those data holdings. And the last thing I'd like to show you is the site log viewer tool. As Carrie mentioned earlier, each of the International Association of Geodesy's geometric services coordinates measurements from the global network of stations. Users need accurate and consistent information about the stations in these networks for their data analysis. Therefore, each service has implemented a site log. This is completed by the station or network operator. The site logs are formatted ASCII text descriptions of the Space Geodesy Station location, environment, equipment, co-located instrumentation, and organization and contact information. Station personnel report changes in the system's configuration by adding and updating information in the site log. The form serves as an historical collection of major changes during the lifetime of the system's installation. Each station site log form is a key source to understand how the station's configuration has changed over time. Since users need to view and search the logs for system information, we've developed a site log viewer tool for the enhanced display and comparison of contact, contents of these site logs. So I'd like to show you now a few And it first takes you to a page with some information uh, about the site log viewer. Right now, under site log type, we have four types listed, SLR, Doris, GNSS, and VLDI. At this time, we just have SLR and Doris available. We're working on the GNSS data and VLDI, and it will be ready in the future. The first thing I'd like to show you is the map at the bottom. Right now, currently, when you land on the page, SLR is selected. And in the map, you'll see these yellow arrows that represent different sites around the world for SLR. Clicking on a site will bring up the name of the site, the latitude and longitude, and the location of it. Well, you can also pan in on this and zoom out. Now, if you'd like to view a log, looking at the Doris, if you select Doris, you'll see a similar map with all of the Doris installations. And you can also click on one of those, and it will bring up some information about it. So the first thing I'd like to show you is how you would view a complete site log for just a single site. 
we're going to go to the map under SLR and select the South African station. We click on the link within the pop-up window and it brings up a form. This is the entire site log for this particular location. On the right, you'll see who, who it was prepared by, the date it was prepared, and the format version would be 1.0. You can click on any of these sections in between and get more information on the right. And if there's too much information for the window, you can scroll through it. If we click on aircraft detection, for instance, this is section 11 of the site log. And this is what describes the uh, aircraft detection. This particular site uses radar to detect aircraft. And it was installed in June of 2000. Also at the top, you'll see a few maps, a few tabs, one labeled map. And you'll see a map that shows exactly where the site is located. As we had chosen, it was in South Africa. And you also get a, you can also look at an image of the site itself. Now, if we want to go back and perform another query, we can hit, submit the new query button at the bottom, and this will take us back to the page that we had before. Now I'd like to show you how to search across multiple site logs for a particular piece of information. If we select the site, Search Across Site Logs tab, you'll get a drop-down menu that will ask you to select a particular section within the form. And once again, we will select aircraft detection. We'd like to see which sites around the world use radar as their aircraft detection type. Once you've selected a subsection, it will bring up another drop-down menu, which will ask you to select detection type, date installed, date removed, and other information. We're going to select detection type. And then that brings up a value to select. These are the different types of detection types used by all of the sites. We'll select radar and then hit the Show button. The result of this is a table that shows the site name, the name of the site log file. And as you can see, it's all radar. We select radar. At the top, you can see what your query was on. We have radar detection. Detection type was radar. So if there's any uh, problem using the site log viewer tool, or if you'd really like to contact us, feel free to click on the Contact Us button at the bottom of the footer. And that concludes the live portion of the website. And Carrie, I turn it back to you. <clears throat> Thanks, Laura. Um, I'll just spend a, a few minutes on uh, our future plans for the CDDIS, including our work in real-time data and application development. The CDDIS is a key data center supporting the international GNSS service discussed earlier. Since starting with the IGS, we have expanded the archive to include support of various pilot projects and working groups formed by the IGS over the years. Through its real-time service, the IGS is extending its capability to support applications requiring real-time access to IGS products, such as GNSS orbit and clock corrections, to the broadcast ephemeris. This enables precise point positioning, time synchronization, and disaster monitoring at global scales. The RTS relies on enhancements to the existing IGS infrastructure. The diagram shown here illustrates the operation of a real-time application at the CDDIS. Using a proto protocol called NTRIP, developed by colleagues within the IGS, Analysis groups can disseminate these orbit and clock corrections to a caster, such as the CDDIS, which then has the capability 
to stream the product, products to a wider group of clients. We are currently interfacing the caster to URS to handle the user registration process since we need to maintain more control over who is listening to the product stream. The CDDIS will also use this configuration to stream data from real-time capable stations. These data will then be made available through the archive. In late 2012, the CDDIS expanded the archive to include data from the IGS multi-GNSS experiment, or MGEX. This experiment aims to conduct a global multi-GNSS signals tracking campaign in parallel to established IGS operations, focusing on tracking si signals from newly available GNSS, such as Galileo, Baidu, QZS. IGS MGEX is facilitating the, the collection of global tracking data that allows a rigorous test of the capabilities of the IGS components to incorporate new systems and their signals. The MGEX data are submitted in sub-hourly, hourly, and daily files. Analysis centers provide products, such as satellite orbits, clock values, Earth rotation parameters, on a daily basis. An update to the existing GNSS format was required to support the additional GNSS signals. Ingest and archive procedures were updated to handle the new format required for multi-GNSS data. The archive now contains data from over 100 additional stations shown in the map, which also illustrates the GNSS tracking capabilities of these stations. The majority of the CDDIS users are familiar with the structure and contents of the archive. However, novice users and even expert users can benefit from learning more about what data are available on a spatial and temporal basis. The CDDIS is, de is developing several applications that will en enable data discovery through access to the metadata extracted through the data ingest process. We will also enhance the site log viewer that Lori demonstrated allowing users to browse and query logs from the global network of GNSS and VLBI sites in addition to the SLR and Doris logs. This last slide provides more information on the CDDIS, our website, and a reference for more details, as well as related websites that you may find of interest. This concludes my presentation. I will now turn it over to Jennifer for her closing remarks. Okay, well thank you, Carrie. So what we're going to do now is we will move to the final set of polling questions. So everybody be sure to stay in the room and or stay on the line, okay? Because after we give these a couple of minutes, we'll move directly to the question and answer period. Okay? Fantastic. I'm going to uh, give everybody a second here.
Okay, I'm going to give this just another minute and then we're going to jump right into the question and answer period. Okay, everybody, I don't see too much movement here on the polling questions. Maybe a couple more seconds and then we are going to move forward here. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the question and answer period. Um, before we do that, just uh, on the final slide here, you can see, um, first I want to thank all of you for participating today. We do have all of our, um, all of them have not been uploaded yet, but we do have all of our webinars on the, at the online catalog URL, the tinyurl.com Earth Data webinar. Our YouTube, NASA Earth Data YouTube channel is fairly new. So I have some of the older webinars uploaded. All of them should be uh, uploaded within the next week or so, um, although you'll find this webinar posted at the Earth Data webinar site sooner. And then we do have um, a Facebook account, and we've got a Twitter account, and a Google Plus. So we'd love to hear from you. All right, well, so let's check out and see if we've got any questions here. All right. Anybody have any questions? Go ahead and type those into the Q&A pod. Okay, Andrew. Don't be shy. Okay. We've got our first question. Could you provide any examples of data applications for the holdings in CDDIS? So, Carrie or Lori? Well, we listed some of the applications. It's mainly to monitor the movements of these sites in the network. So by knowing their positions and their velocities over time, you can apply that to other applications, such as plate tectonics or um, you know, those, those type of, of applications. Um, they are also, uh, GNSS data are also used for um, deriving various atmospheric parameters such as uh, total electron content in the troposphere and some ionosphere parameters. I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but... So Bryce, if that answers your question, um, go ahead and type into the Q&A Q &A pod. There's also some, um, and, and I could actually Either I could email this or um, Lori or Carrie could offline. There are some stories that have been written by um, various PIs in one of our publications called Sensing Our Planet that provide some examples of how these data have been used for applications and research. So we could certainly send that out um, after the fact, no problem. Okay. And our next question uh, is, let's see, there are far more, it's more of a comment combination question. There are far more GNSS stations out there than shown. How can GNSS sites be recruited, quote unquote, to the program? Yes, you're definitely correct. As I said in one of my uh, slides, there are uh, other um, groups and countries that have very concentrated GNSS uh, networks. Um, the the 500-ish sites that I, I noted in that the CDDIS deals with 
are mainly in support of the International GNSS Service. Um, one of the activities that we have cooperated in is um, called GSAC, which we do have referenced on our home page. And that is a way of cataloging and providing uh, information about GNSS sites in other programs. So um, that, that's a way to, to learn more about what other GNSS are out there. Okay, well thank you, Carrie. The next question is uh, also a combination. I would like to access GNF, GNSS excuse me, data from all locations. Is it possible to do that? Well, as we just said, there are thousands and thousands of GNSS sites around the world. You could certainly access the data from all the sites that we have within the CDDIS. Um, and then I can provide you more information about how to, to learn about what other sites are out there that are, for example, cataloged within the, um, within the GSAC that I mentioned. And so this is something uh, that Carrie can follow up with, uh, with this user offline. So all of these questions have been captured and they don't disappear at the end of the webinar. So um, we can follow up with this uh, in further detail offline, okay? All right, so the next question is from Tom. Is there a reference point either on Earth or in space about which all movements are measured? There, there is what we call the reference frame, which is what was discussed briefly in, in the webinar. Um, and if you monitor that over time, yes, then you are measuring movement of the Earth. The quasars used in VLBI can be thought of as a, as a celestial reference frame. And that helps us orient the Earth in space. Okay, so thank you, Carrie. The next question uh, and comment is from Wendy. The site log viewer application is temporarily unavailable now. Does this happen often? <laughs> well, yes. No, it doesn't happen often. But um, <clears throat> Lori was demonstrating the site log viewer on our development system. Um, we have had uh, an issue on our operational website that we've have to, uh, had to uh, address. And so the site log viewer had to be taken offline, but we hope to have that back online very soon. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so here's an addition uh, to the previous comment regarding you know, the number of GNSS stations. And uh, Andrew followed up with, for instance, there are many geodetic quality GNSS sites in the UK and US which are operated not for profit. Um, government and academic, for instance, I see no reason why all of these shouldn't be included. Well, yeah, the IGS has, um, has included many sites, mainly for the, for the purpose of densifying the reference frame. So they usually look for sites that are in places where there are big holes, so to speak, such as Africa. We don't have a lot of sites in Africa or in Asia, in Russia, or China. And so we look to densify those. Where we have a lot of sites, such as in California, we don't need to add to the IGS network for that. OK, and then there's a follow-up. Is there a quick way to determine the age of the archive for each GNS site on a map? No, we don't have that right now. But we hope to develop an application that will allow you to for example, enter a area of interest and say, what data do you have here and what time span does that uh, uh, cover? OK, and the one thing I didn't mention, and so I'll just throw this out there for those of you who are um, interested, our Twitter account is at NASA Earth Data. Um, with a capital N and a capital E, and that's, although perhaps it doesn't matter, um, and that is an account that is not specific to CDDIS. It's more specific to all 12 of our data centers, so I might post information about new data products, um, new tools, or just increase some awareness for existing tools or any news with the data centers or the project. So, um, fantastic. 
I uh, figured I would address that in case there are others interested as well, since there was the question. So how would one currently search GNSS for time period versus location? Well, right now, um, we don't have a, a data discovery tool other than the GSAC, which we have a link to on our website, but we don't provide direct access to that. Um, that's something that we have to add yet. Um, right now, the uh, reports area that, that Lori referred to in the website demonstration or underneath uh, the GNSS data holdings area, there are some flat files that will show you what we have on a weekly basis or on a, a, a yearly basis. So it's not really good for data discovery, and that's where we want to concentrate next. Okay, thank you, Carrie. And let's see. All right, Andrew says thanks. Any other questions? Anybody else have any questions? Okay, Andrew has no further questions. Anybody else? Okay, well, if there are no further questions, I'll give it just another minute or so. Um, what we'll do is we will, uh, you know, conclude this webinar. I will be uh, logging off from the telecon. However, we will leave the room open for an additional five to ten minutes for those of you who are interested in uh, downloading any of the presentations. They're posted here below in a PDF format as well as PowerPoint. Okay, so thank you so much everybody for joining us. We did lose a few people uh, toward the end. I appreciate you being in the room. Our next webinar is going to be held on, uh, on June 12th and will actually be a, uh, the NASA postdoctoral program will be presenting. Um, and at the site you see on the, at the URL, tinyurl.com, I have a link for people to sign up to an Earth Data webinar mailing list where you can receive announcements in the future for upcoming webinars. Okay, so the next one will be focused on the postdoc program and uh, if you're a professor, and I don't have their, you know, meeting room set up yet, but certainly if you're a professor and you've got you know, some grad students who possibly might be interested, you could forward this information along. Thanks very much, everybody. Oh, well, hold on a second. All right, thank you, Armand. All right, I hope to see you again in the future. All right, bye-bye now.